Unite represents um, a whole range of vulnerable workers. Uh, in particular, let me just categorise them in a, in, a few, uh, in a few words. So first of all, our biggest growth area in the last 12 months has been amongst young workers which is really important for us. But one of the things that we've established very quickly with talking to those young workers and organising them is that many of them, the, the predominant number of them, work in very vulnerable working situations, very precarious situations. They're involved in casualised employment, they're involved in zero hours, many of them, zero hours contracts, and also they're subject to uh, poor treatment, bullying, and almost um, a problem with the fear of taking time or standing up to the employers, taking time off sick, so an element of presenteeism as we might call it. The nature of precarious employment is such that it massively impacts on the mental ill health of uh, people because of course there's a fear culture that's bred with casualisation of work that you almost feel um, emasculated, you feel in, in unable to raise points of concern and those points are often points around the safety of the workplace, it could be um, the physical safety of the workplace, the problems that they encounter in the work, uh, it could actually be their mental ill health. The other, the other factor I think which is quite important here is the fact that um, in terms of health and safety we know that in unionised workplaces that safety is much better obviously because we're organised. In ununionised places the reverse is true and for many of these young workers they operate in, a, in sectors which are predominantly ununionised or have low union density and therefore many of the risks they encounter will be enhanced. Interestingly the Sports Direct campaign that we've been involved in for a few years or a couple of years now uh, started because some quite serious cases came to us from the Sports Direct warehouse where we had some members uh, in uh, Shirebrook in Derbyshire. These, uh, these issues were centred around a number of factors such as the use of uh, casual employment, zero hours contracts and agencies. The use of the agencies itself was not the problem, it was the way in which the agencies were often treating workers and some of the work practices in, the, in that workplace. So we're talking here about a workplace of around 4,000 workers. We're talking here about a large migrant workforce for whom most of them their first language is not English. And we're talking about issues which had come up around sexual exploitation of young women on the shop floor. We're talking about um, practical issues such as fire exits being blocked which were raised with us, such as uh, health and safety concerns in the picking operation in the warehouse. There were other concerns around the use the agency made of something called six strikes and you're out, which, which frightened people um, into, um, and th in terms of their behavior. So for instance, with six strikes and you're out, talking to you, on the uh, on when I'm working could be a strike. Uh, going off sick would be a strike. So if you had an accident and went off sick, equally it could be a strike. Six strikes, you no longer work. So it's very easy to gather strikes. Even going to the toilet is a problem because if you go to the toilet in the eyes of your employer, your manager, too many times or you spend too long there, then it's a strike. Now with, with a culture like that, you can imagine the exploitation and discrimination which goes on. So um, this is not unusual, it's not the only sector that deals in this. We've come across this in areas like the white meat industry where young women, again, uh, sexual exploitation, if you want to do a good shift, if you want to work overtime, you have to give the phone, your phone number or go out on a date or worse with one of the managers. The manager's predominantly male, the shop floor are predominantly female. Predominantly, again, these are young migrant women who are suffering this type of exploitation. Uh, we also found in call centre environments, again, not anything to do with that sector, another sector in the finance sector, we found instances of toilet breaks also being used uh, in a discriminatory fashion. Uh, let me just give you one example of that. So there was a manager in a large call centre who decided to bring in something which he I note it's a man, uh, decided to bring in something which he thought was going to help in terms of 
uh, not discriminating against women because the imposition of a new code of practice around toilet breaks was such that many workers were getting disciplined because they were having too many toilet breaks in the eyes of management and this was impacting on the call rate. So what they decided to do was they recognised that women as they were having their periods would actually need to potentially use the toilets more, more often. So therefore they gave these women plastic pieces, a magnetic plastic um, uh, thing that they stuck on the side of their computer to indicate that during that particular time they were on their period. And now you can imagine the embarrassment, the, and it's a monitoring method, but it's also, it's extremely discriminatory. You know, it's an appalling practice. And the union obviously stopped that as it stopped many of the practices that I've mentioned to you. Um, but we're seeing these practices, not just in Sports Direct, not just in warehousing, but in every sector of the economy, especially where precarious work is a factor, and especially where migrant labour is a factor, and especially where the first language isn't English. And of course, the way in which we've started to combat that is organising industrially, organising politically, uh, starting to build campaigns, but also giving very practical skills to workers, such as English for speakers of other languages, and building their understanding and their knowledge of the world of work and the legislation that applies that they can actually raise issues with the employer and they shouldn't be getting penalised for that and that the union is there to support them uh, if they are penalised for those issues. One of the things that, um, one ways in which the workers health safety and welfare has improved as a result of the campaign that we entered into and their working conditions, pay and, um, and terms are because they've now, the Sports Direct agency that they use, they've actually now abandoned the six strike and your out policy, which I mentioned earlier. Um, they've also uh, now changed the store staff from zero hours contracts to a distinct hourly contract where they have a minimum number of hours per week that they can work. 90% of those staff have now been changed onto those. We're still trying to make inroads in the warehouse with changing the zero hours but we're having some success in that. Um, also, uh, one of the things that uh, has, has been changed is another uh, practice which was used, which was the search and stop and search policy. Now, in most companies operate in, that, in a warehousing environment, operate a stop and search policy, but it's normally a random one in 10, one in 20, but Sports Direct were operating a much more rigorous system, which meant workers were often waiting for up to an hour before they were able to leave their workplace. This was on their own time. So the way in which the union used our legal and industrial campaigning skills was to argue that this was a breach of the national minimum wage regulations because these workers were expected to stay often up to five or six hours a week extra. And of course, being on low wages anyway, that put them under the minimum wage. We won that uh, and we've, uh, we've won uh, money back for those workers. Some of the other things, it was interesting, I went to the Sports Direct AGM um, this year and one of the things that was done is uh, Mike Ashley took the, the, uh, sorry, the, the owner of Sports Direct, where he owns 55% of the shares, took uh, ourselves on a tour of the warehouse and many of the issues which we'd identified as huge health and safety breaches, such as blocked uh, fire escapes, lack of notices, uh, dangerous practices in picking aisles, all of these things, when we went around that warehouse, we didn't see any of them. Now, you may say that this is a bit like the Queen and when she visits a hospital and thinks the world smells of fresh paint. But in actual fact, it was quite interesting to see how things had radically changed within that working environment. Our job, I think, our task is to keep well organised so that things don't go back to what they were before and so that we maintain those changes and those improvements in safety that clearly have occurred. And of course, some of the really difficult problems that we encountered, which were actually publicised in the Panorama documentary, things like the woman who had a, a baby in the toilet, the man who had a, a stroke in the canteen and no one noticed for uh, probably around half an hour, 
uh, because it was quite common for people to be so tired that they would fall asleep in the canteen anyway. Some of those practices hopefully have been addressed by the fact that we've started to be more visible within the workplace, we've got more members within the workplace and many of those members are more confident now because of the work that we've tried to do with them to build their confidence, their knowledge and their skills to tackle and challenge inequality and health and safety issues within their working environment.